Welcome this day to worship. Know that God's love is always with us. But especially now as we take time to refresh our souls and come together in God's name, even in this virtual world that we are in right now. May love be our guiding principle and may you find love as you worship this day. God has been looking for you. Where have you been off to this time? We've been around. There are so many directions in our lives. How long has it been? It's been too long since we were reminded of God unrelenting love. Are you ready? We're ready. We're exhausted chasing the elusive dream of the world. We need God. Then come home. Come back to the place where you are loved, no matter what. Gladly we come home. Gladly we are here. Gladly we sing of the welcoming love of God. Settle your hearts as you join me in prayer. God of grace and God of glory, come and be known to us in our gathering together. Come and be present in the songs we hear and sing and in the prayers we raise. From the busy byways of life, we come to find once again that you are always present and always ready to receive us. As we affirm our faith this day, Deepen the roots of our commitment that we may learn your ca calling upon our lives. Surround us now with the love and comfort of your Holy Spirit and the direction of forgiveness of Christ. Amen. Amen. John 12, 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Psalm 
Have you guys ever planted a seed? What does it look like when you start? What does this seed look like? Um, usually they look really small, small little cute balls. There's not much to them, is there? Mm-hmm. And what happens to the seed after you plant it? Grows. And does it, it grows and it looks alive all of a sudden, right? Today's story is kind of a long one. It's a story that takes very careful listening and thinking. But the story asks a question, what is the greatest power in the world? How would you answer that question? I think the greatest power in the world is God because he can control all things. Okay. How about you, Lindsay? Um, I think that um, makes it grow because he likes life. Okay. Let's listen to our story and see what it says about the greatest power. Hi, Sycamore Canyon students. It's me, Mrs. Hellard in the library. And today I have a very interesting story called The Greatest Power. And it's written and illustrated by an author that just goes by the name of Demi. Some of you guys may have heard of this story before. And for some of you, it may be a new story, but I think you guys will really like it. Let's get started. The Greatest Power by Demi. A long time ago in China, there was a boy emperor named Ping who was known throughout the kingdom for his honesty and his love of harmony. The boy emperor enjoyed climbing to the top of the palace and looking through his big telescope at the heavens. All the millions of stars and the sun and the moon and the space in between were in perfect harmony. My kingdom should be as harmonious as the heavens, he thought. Emperor Ping needed the wisest prime minister in all the land to bring the harmony of the heavens to the kingdom. How would the emperor choose such a prime minister? Because he loved the heavens so much, he decided to let the heavens choose. The next day, a proclamation was issued. All the children in the kingdom were to come to the palace. There, they would be given a quest that would prove which child was the wisest in the land. That wise child would become would become the new prime minister. All the children in the kingdom came from far and wide to learn about Emperor Ping's quest. In one year's time, the emperor announced, we shall have a great parade. And in that parade, each of you will show me what you think is the greatest power in the world. To know the greatest power in the world is to know the greatest peace. Whoever knows this harmony will become the new prime minister. The emperor concluded, a wise person must be able to see the unseen and know the unknown. The excited children left the palace to begin their quest. This is easy, said some of the boys. Whoever has the greatest weapons has the greatest power in the world. For whoever has the greatest weapons can conquer the world. And they began mixing paper mache to make axes and shields, spears and swords bows and arrows and masks of famous warriors and evil spirits to scare away the enemy. This is easy, said some of the girls. Whoever has the greatest beauty has the greatest power in the world, for whoever has the greatest beauty can command the most powerful commander in the world. And they began creating beautiful costumes, each more intricate and delicate than the next, with colorful silk ribbons, embroidered flowers, sparkling sequins and golden threads. This is easy, said some of the more studious children. Whoever has the greatest technology has the greatest power in the world. For whoever has the greatest technology can rule the world. And they began reconstructing brilliant Chinese ideas that had changed the world. They built clocks and balanced compasses, wove silk and forged iron, crafted porcelain and set movable type, rolled paper and bound books. This is easy, said some of the more practical children. Whoever has the greatest amount of money has the greatest power in the world. For whoever has the greatest amount of money can buy anything in the world. And they began making huge golden coins and a statue of the money god, Guan Yu. Only one child, a little girl named Sing, remembered the emperor's words. A wise person must be able to see the unseen and know the unknown. She sat by a lotus pond and thought about how armies rise and fall, how beauty fades, how money comes and goes, and how ideas are forever changing. Could these be the greatest powers in the world if they didn't even last? 
Sing looked at all the beautiful flowers. The lotus was the flower of purity and transformation. Born from a tiny seed sleeping in the mud, the bud rose through the water on a strong green stem. It rose above the water to bloom into a glorious flower that faced heaven. What a big story there is in one tiny seed, thought Sing. How powerful is the force of life? By autumn, some boys who thought the emperor possessed the greatest power in the world had made dragon costumes. The dragon was the emperor's symbol of wealth, wisdom, and power. By winter, some girls who thought the empress possessed the greatest power behind the throne had made great phoenix costumes. The phoenix was the empress's symbol of loyalty and power. By spring, Sing still had made nothing to show the emperor. She asked herself, how can I see the unseen and know the unknown? She looked up at the heavens. It seemed that from empty space, everything came alive. The millions of stars and the sun and the moon were lit and everything was in perfect harmony. To Sing, it seemed the heavens were in a great pattern of eternal life and suddenly she had an idea. The great parade day came. All the children of the kingdom came with their most marvelous creations, each one sure that they had figured out the greatest power in the world. Last of all was Sing, her small hands clenched in front of her. Sing, cried one of the other children. Don't you have anything to show the emperor? I do have something to show the emperor, Sing said, but the other children just laughed at her. The children marched before Emperor Ping with waving flags, swirling silks and glistening gold. It was a grand parade. Emperor Ping did not say a word. At the end of the parade was Sing. Stop the parade, shouted Emperor Ping. He called Sing to come before him. Haven't you anything to show me? Do you know what the greatest power in the world might be? The other children laughed, but Sing held out her hands. She was holding a lotus seed, which she broke in two before the emperor. What is there? asked Emperor Ping. Nothing, said Sing, and the greatest power in the world. How can nothing be the greatest power in the world? asked the emperor. The nothing in this seed is the space in between where life exists, said Sing. The nothing in this seed is what makes the seed rise from the earth. The nothing in this seed is what is fed by water, air, and the fire of the sun to bloom into a glorious flower that turns its face toward the heavens. And when the flower sleeps again, it releases new seeds into the earth, which are fed by water, air, and the fire of the sun to bloom into new flowers. The nothing in this seed is eternal life. It continues from seed to seed forever and ever in perfect harmony. So life is the greatest power in the world. Emperor Ping smiled. He turned to the crowd and declared, here is someone who has seen the unseen and knows the unknown. By bringing us this lotus seed, Sing has helped us to see and know the greatest power in the world. She is the wisest child of all the land. And now I name her the new prime minister of all the kingdom. And that's the end of this fabulous story, The Greatest Power by Demi. I sure hope you liked it and I'll see you next time. Bye. Just like Sing said in our story, a seed doesn't look like much, but seeds grow and die and then grow again over and over. It's both a strange and amazing experience to bury a seed in the ground and discover sometimes in just a few days, the new life that it brings. In our scripture verses today, Jesus is talking to the disciples about a grain of wheat dying so that it can become a plant because Jesus knows that he will soon stop being Jesus in the way the disciples know him. Jesus knows he's going to die and then be resurrected and be alive again. Once he's resurrected, he's going to be different. Jesus wants his disciples and us to think about his life, death, and resurrection in the same way that they would think about a seed turning into a plant. He wants them to know that in his new life, he will be like a plant that keeps growing and has new seeds. And he wants us to know that he will always be there for us. So during this season of Lent, we remember all that Jesus did for us and gave up for us, even his own life. And very soon when it is time for Easter, we will marvel and celebrate the fact that Jesus rose again. And that my friends is why we get to live forever with Jesus and why eternal life 
is the greatest power. Let's do some wondering. I wonder how seeds are like Jesus. Seeds are like Jesus because Jesus keeps growing and seeds keep growing. Excellent. That was a hard question. I wonder why it's important that we take this time to think about Jesus's life and death before we celebrate Easter. I think it is important to do that because we need to prepare properly so that we're ready to see Jesus again. Excellent. It makes Easter more special, doesn't it? It's a time to reflect. I wonder where we can look for Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. Cooper, how about you? Where can you look for Jesus? In the heavens. In the heavens. And Lindsay? In your heart. In your heart. Oh my goodness. Those are all such good answers. Let's pray together. Are you ready? Dear God, thank you for Jesus who died but came alive again just for us, much like seeds and flowers that grow again every spring. Help us look for Jesus wherever we go. And remember that the life we have in him is the greatest power of all. Amen. Amen. Some Greeks were attending the festival of the Passover. They came to Philip and said to him, Sir, we would see Jesus. That's our need too, isn't it? We would see Jesus. Somebody show us what Jesus is like. There's something missing. Something that needs to be filled. It's hard to put a name to it, but it's there. The person struggling to make ends meet and the financial wizard both have the same need to fill that empty place in their lives. There's a basic craving. Sir, we would see Jesus. You see, we need Jesus. We need him for life and grace and to give meaning to our existence. And like the Greeks, we ask, sir, we would see Jesus. So where do we see Jesus? Well, there are several places, but the first that comes to my mind is in our faith record. We can encounter Jesus in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and, and all the epistles. To be sure, it's not a complete record. And we don't have any idea what Jesus looked like, whether he was tall or short, slender or chubby. But you know, I think the lack of specific information about what Jesus looked like is really a blessing. It, it makes it easier for Jesus to come into our lives and meet us where we are and where he knows our needs are. Not that we have a license to abuse that and make Jesus into something that he's not, but the same kind, loving, and forgiving Jesus who touched lives over 2,000 years ago still touches people's lives today. Cal Samra, in his book, The, the Joyful Christ, tells of a time when he needed healing and found a new vision of Jesus. Over, over a period of time, Cal's life fell apart. His failing health had driven him to, to move far away from his family and his friends to the, the warm environment of Arizona. His health had also forced him to leave his job. His marriage failed. He was worn out, sick, lonely, and depressed. At the age of 50, he didn't feel like he had any hope left. And so he decided to kill himself. 
about a length of rope, dro drove out into the desert looking for something sturdy to hang himself from. But the palm trees were too high. The cacti were too short. Then he thought about a river. No luck, it was summertime and all the rivers had dried up. Finally, he decided he needed a less permanent solution to his problem and he, and he drove to a Franciscan retreat. He entered the chapel there and began to pray out the sorrow of his heart. And a warm, cheerful Franciscan, Father Gavin Griffith, welcomed Cal and asked him to stay for dinner. Father Griffith kept Cal laughing throughout the dinner with his jokes and humorous remarks. On the wall of the kitchen was a picture Cal had never seen before. It was the portrayal of a vigorous, joyful Jesus titled The Laughing Christ. Before Cal left the retreat center, Father Lambert gave him another picture, very similar. It was much like the first picture of the laughing Christ. It didn't portray a pale, blonde, sorrowful man with a glowing halo like many of the pictures. This Jesus was dark skinned, strong, healthy looking. He had a broad smile and he, he glowed with warmth and good cheer. His gaze was straightforward and honest. This was a warm, personable Jesus, the kind of man anyone would want to follow. As Cal contemplated those two images of Jesus, he, he realized he had never really known that side of Christ. This new way of seeing his Savior was the beginning of his emotional healing. Cal became the head of the Fellowship of Mary Christians, if you've happened to hear, hear of them. I think there's still a page online, and they still continue to go on and on. We would see Jesus. We can start with the faith record and know that Jesus will meet our deepest of needs. The second place we see Jesus is not, may not be quite as obvious to us. In fact, it may be a place we don't want to look, I don't know. In Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. It is in the least of these that we can also see Jesus. Noble Stanton in his book, Check Your Commitment, tells about something unforgettable that happened when he was a control tower supervisor in Japan. Two jet fighters were flying in formation and had just started their descent when the lead pilot radioed that he'd lost his wingman. That meant his plane had gone down. Tower picked up the special red phone that connected them to the rescue helicopter team that was on standby duty. When that phone was lifted, a rescue team was to be in the air in 120 seconds. The lead pilot descended below the clouds looking for his wingman. When he found him, he could see he'd bailed out, but all he could do was circle overhead helplessly. My wingman is tangled in his parachute. Have you notified the helicopter, he said desperately. He's, fl he's floating, but having a difficult time getting his life raft inflated. Have you commissioned the helicopter? Minutes later, they heard another message. He's still not inflated. He's beginning to sink. Where's the rescue team? Minutes later, another plaintiff plea. Now he's above water, but still struggling. Where's the helicopter? Still later. He's about four or five feet under. I don't know if he'll come up again. Where is the helicopter? Seconds later, I can't see him. I fear we've lost him. 
Where is the helicopter? Where was the helicopter? Never got to the scene. At the investigation and hearing, it was discovered that the rescue team had decided to do some Christmas shopping at the PX 50 miles away. The team was so busy taking care of themselves that they never heard the cries for help. There are people all around us struggling with life. Families struggling, teenagers struggling, people living on the edge of life. Can we look in the eyes of someone who's hurting and see Jesus there? Or are we off in our own world concerned about our own needs and wants? It's easy to do, isn't it? Like the rescue team, are we off taking care of ourselves and can't see the need? You see, discipleship has little to do with attending this or that. All those things, church, etc., are where we sensitize ourselves so we can see Jesus. Is our heart open enough to see Jesus in the least of these? Not only do we see Jesus in the least of these, we see Jesus in one another. We ought to be able to see Jesus in one another, shouldn't we? You may have heard it said, you're the only Bible some people will ever read. We could also say, say you are the only Jesus some people will ever meet. Now, it might be easy to get discouraged at this point. Not every person who calls himself or herself a, a Christian has Christ's heart. And the truth is, even those of us who are doing our very best to live as Christ calls us, have times when we fail miserably. Philip Yancey tells of a t-shirt he spotted at a political rally, Jesus, save us from your followers. He also mentions a line in the New Zealand film, Heavenly Creatures, in which two girls describe their imaginary kingdom. They say, it's like heaven. Only better, there aren't any Christians. <laughs> One of the most bitter moments of my life, said a missionary, was when an earnest young boy said to me, I want to believe in Christ, but I've never seen him in those who profess him. How can I believe in someone whom I've not seen. Ouch. Sir, we would see Jesus, says our world. A Christian, says Robert E. Gibson, is the keyhole through which other folks see God. There's our responsibility and our opportunity. What are our lives reflecting? What do people see in us? Sometimes they do see Jesus. And that is the hopeful word for today. Earl Palmer in his little book called The Enormous Exception tells the story of a student at the University of California, Berkeley, who became a Christian after a long journey through doubts and questions. When Palmer asked the young man, why he had chosen Jesus Christ, he answered that what had tipped the scales for him in his spiritual journey were the actions of a Christian classmate. During the previous term, the student had been very ill with flu and 
as a result, had missed 10 days of school without any fanfare or complaints. His Christian classmate carefully collected all his class assignments and took time away from his own stu studies to help him catch up. The student told Palmer, you know, this kind of thing just isn't done. I wanted to know why this guy acted the way he did. I even found myself asking if I could go to church with him. An act of love with no fanfare, no glory. But a friend saw Jesus there. We need to ask ourselves, can others see Christ in us? If we were the only Jesus people ever met, would it be enough to tip the scales? Does the loving, forgiving face of Jesus permeate your life? Or is it just something for once in a while that we kind of put on? Sir, we would see Jesus. We see him in the faith record. He's there for us. We see him in the least of these. And, and with God's help, he's seen in each of us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes we don't reflect your love. We don't reflect your son. We just reflect our own selfishness. Help us, O oh God, that we might reflect you as we live our lives. And when we need you, help us to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.